was talking to Jack yesterday and he said, you know, really ask the gentleman about how they're going to get these rare earths to the permanent magnets. That's Jack's favorite question. So Mark, do you want to take a run at that first? Well, step by step, right? You got to have all those steps in place. So uh, I think the relationship that uh, Energy Fuels has had with Neo and Constantine and his team, uh, we've been creatively looking at how do we create integration uh, starting with the, our main focus is on monocyte, monocyte sands, um, securing the monocyte, going through the cracking and leaching, uh, shipping the carbonate to, to NEO, um, and, you know, looking at these various steps on how we can have that full integration. So, you know, I think, I think um, the unique thing about the relationship with energy fuels and NEO, uh, I think we've done more to integrate that anybody else out there in the world outside of China. But anyways, in it's a, um, in a short period of time and being creative with the infrastructure. So, you know, we're excited about that. And, um, but there's a lot of work to do because the demand, again, is increasing quicker than people can respond. But, but some of us can respond quicker than others. And of course, that's my favorite series of questions. I mean, I don't know how we're going to meet this demand. I mean, every day I turn on the television, 3.7 billion, uh, you know, company A, 4.98 billion, you know, Ontario government on the critical materials rare supply chain, GM, Ford, everybody's committing to all these EV, EV vehicles, but we don't have the materials. So let's talk about this relationship you two have put together. Constantine, you're known as being a brilliant strategist. How has this relationship evolved since you've been together now for what, two years? A couple of years. Um, you were kind enough to provide an introduction a couple of years ago to Mark and myself, and we took it from there. Um, I always felt that uh, monazites, because historically were a big part of the source uh, of rare earths for the, for the industry, um, the monazites, which were not being used up until recently, um, really were the game changer that once you can get your hands on monazites and you can process them correctly and responsibly, then you could go a long way alleviating the, uh, the resource availability problem. Monazite is a fantastic material, but it comes with typically uranium and thorium, radioactive elements, and that's when Mark and I had the conversation. We realized that between the two of us, we had all the pieces of the puzzle that we could put together a very full supply chain. To go back to Jack's question, how do you get all the way to magnets? So Mark is buying uh, monazites that are a byproduct of existing mining operations. So you can effectively say the mining cost is very, very low, if not zero. And then we've worked together, Mark has put together a flow sheet uh, at Energy Fuels in Utah where he takes out the uranium for the uranium business for his customers and recovers the rare earths in a way that works for us. And then we take it into separation we separate the rare earth elements, then we may turn them into metals, alloys, and finally magnets. And we're in the process of finalizing the design and engineering of, um, of a new magnet facility that we're planning to build in Europe, in Estonia, uh, next to our existing rare earth processing facility, hopefully with a lot more uh, material that we can get from uh, energy fuels. Mark, you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, um, you know, I think, um, it's, it's, it's been a very uh, productive uh, relationship. Um, uh, I think the, both companies are comfortable working with each other because we are doers, not promoters. We're trying to accomplish uh, big things by actually doing it on the ground. Uh, I think there's been some really good uh, uh, information exchanges between the two groups. Uh, you know, I think you've seen, you know, we had this originally agreement with Kimors. We still have an agreement with Kimors for their monazite in the United States. But we've recently got binding agreements to secure a very large land position in Brazil. Uh, we're still doing our due diligence, but I don't see anything coming in the way of that from, from what I'm seeing right now. But that will increase our supply, we believe, of uh, substantially increase the supply of monazite in due course which then can go through the mill and turn into carbonate. So, so I think that when you look at both companies and how we complement each other, um, how we're working together, um, 
you know, I, I, I think it's, it's a remarkable relationship, and, and, and we're really tied together by a supply agreement, but it's, it's more than that. It's more than that. You know, so, uh, you know, just watch this space as it ramps up. I mean, I think that, that collectively our goals are to be, you know, world significant in terms of the integration. I mean, we're world significant what we do already. Um, for us, we're, we're small commercial. We've got to ramp that up. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking at a world significant um, uh, integrated supplier of rare earth products from the beginning to the end, really, magnets. So let's talk about the timeline. What kind of timeline are we looking at? And, and why don't you just toss in? Is GM going to make these exceptional you know, uh, objectives that they have communicated to all of us, you know, uh, they're going to give us electric cars by, what, 2035? Well, I think, I think he who has the elements is going to win the race. He who doesn't have the elements isn't going to win the race. So, uh, yeah, look, I, I, think, I think people underestimate how long it takes to get the flywheel turning, uh, you know, but at the same time, I think that where we are, where Neil's at, We've got such a head start on others that we can move faster, but still, it, it's still going to take a few years. It's going to take three, four years, five years to get that momentum up to where it needs to be um, to really start making a major difference. You know, we, we can do, we're making a major difference now, but you know, to get the scale ramped up. Well, Tracy, listen, I, I, I always have said, and I've, uh, whenever I speak at conferences or in your program, that demand creates supply. It's not the other way around. So last uh, November, Mark and I were summoned by a massive European automotive uh, manufacturer uh, who basically said, we love what you're doing. We need you now to make magnets for our EV drivetrains. And you know, you, you can't get a better manifestation of uh, demand uh, uh, than, than that. So we're very, Neil is very focused on getting our phase one and then eventually phase two magnet production up and running in Estonia. We expect to have a, an investment decision this year, hopefully sooner rather than later. And then we'll start building by the end of the year and hopefully we'll be ramping up in 2024 because the European automakers have made it very clear, along with their supply chains, with their tier ones that Mark and I have been meeting with, that by 2025, they want 50% of their critical components, the high value added components for their EVs to come from European uh, circular, transparent, resilient sources. So there really, there isn't an awful lot of time to do this, but I guess collectively, Energy Fuels and Neil, we have all the missing pieces. So Mark is processing the, uh, the, the raw material. It gets it to the point where we can use it. Um, he also has plans to separate in the United States, uh, rare us, which is a good thing because Neil is a net buyer. A lot of people don't know this, but in addition to separating our own materials, we are buying an awful lot of separated rare earths. So we'd, we'd love to work with Mark on that front. Then we already, as I said earlier, we turn rare earth oxides into metals, alloys, and eventually magnetic powders and magnets. So if anyone can get there sooner, uh, that's probably the combination of um, uh, you know, the, the, the collaborative effort between energy fuels and ourselves. So we're looking at a couple of years down the road to be in position. Whether GM and Ford and Daimler and Volkswagen will be doing what they said, uh, what they, they're planning to do, uh, usually these, these big uh, folks uh, do the things that they said they were going to do. And, and given all the momentum that um, exists, not only in EVs, and EVs is a large market for rare earths, but the whole energy transition, um, I think, um, I, 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 you know, I can't say it uh, effectively enough, but we need more rare earths extracted, we need more rare earths recycled, we need more rare earth, rare earths produced, and we need more rare earth magnets. And there is going to be room for a lot of players in this field, but we kind of like the position that, uh, that we, both of us are in the supply chain and within the largest industry. 
So of course, that brings me to my last and favorite question, which is there's a lot of promoters out there. Everyone's going, I I've got some rare earths, you know, and, and, and everyone needs rare earths. You've got to buy my stock. Can you give investors, Mark, I know you're an investor as well, some advice as they're doing due diligence on some of these companies that claim they have these critical materials? Well, like the rare earth business, like the uranium business, there's a lot of wannabes, a lot of people that, that like to talk about what they're going to do. You know, I believe that you got to look at who's going to get it across the finish line. And, and a good place to start is people that have the track record of doing that, have the technical skills, have the infrastructure, have the ability to respond and deliver. Okay? I mean, I think if you look at our two companies, we have those track records. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because I always laugh when people declare victory on the rare earth business or the uranium business because they did something in a beaker, right? And they say, we've done it, we've, we, you know, it was successful and, you know, all these great things. But uh, a beaker is a beaker and a beaker isn't representative of doing it at commercial scale. You know, we're, we're doing stuff at commercial scale. Certainly Neil's been doing stuff at commercial scale for, for decades. And, um, but most projects that I've dealt with in the world with, from the beginning, the ones I've dealt with have been successful, but most other projects fail. They fail. They don't achieve their objectives. So, you know, I just, I think there's, 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 there's two kind of investments you make. Speculative investments that you kind of get into stock and out of the stock, and, and stocks that you get into because you know they're actually going to achieve something. And, and I think that's what an investment is, and particularly our company and NEO, is we're going to be doing something and, and, and making contributions based on the fact that we have the ability to actually deliver. I'll tell you, that makes me misty-eyed. <laughs> Constantine, do you have anything to add to that? I think that was a, a wonderful uh, piece of wisdom. Uh, Tracy, unfortunately, there are no easy answers. So people who decide to invest in the rare earth space, they need to do a lot of work. We all, or most of us, remember uh, 2010, 11, and you know the what happened around those times when prices increased by an order of magnitude, driven by purely artificial supply constraints from China, export restrictions. So this time around, this environment, I think, is driven by much better fundamentals, which is demand. So, how do you invest in uh, in the space? Well, look at you know the, the, the various. I mean, if you're looking at the upstream at deposits and so on, look at tonnage and grade. I mean, that's true for every uh, commodity, but then look at mineralogy and uh, metallurgy. How easy is it to take the rock from the ground into something useful? And then look at the commercial uh, acumen of the people involved. Are they close to their customers? Are they? Do they have relationships with the people who ultimately will buy their material? Because rare earths is not the rare earths are not gold or copper you know, or nickel. You're not going to sell them on some exchange. Uh, and um, pricing and con a commercial relations are not transparent. I mean, you need, it's, it's full contact marketing. One customer at a time, the contracts in place, pricing negotiations and so on. So it, it takes an awful lot of work to, to pick the winners and losers and, and what sort of companies you should be investing in. So, sorry, no, no shortcuts. Uh, so thank you both for joining us today. I hope you enjoy PDAC, and uh, we always appreciate the updates. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Tracy. Tracy.